Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from across Canada. My name is Christopher Brown, and I'm your host. Over the course of this show, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, we are honored today to have our guest on the show. Please help me welcome to the show, Town of Kipling, Saskatchewan's Mayor, Pat Jackson. Pat, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Pat, uh, we we met uh, recently at SUMA, and I, I told you one of the questions that I usually ask people, so you're no exception. Um, where does your sense of duty to serve come from, Pat? I think part of it came from my my parents and my grandfather. One grandfather lived with us for a number of years, but it's I've always been a little bit of a news junkie and when we moved to this community almost 40 years ago uh, I I happened to have a, a lot more time on my hands and started looking around for what things would interest me uh, there was a municipal election upcoming and I thought well this is something I've never tried before and it sounds very interesting so I put my name in and was elected. Was politics that discussed? Was, at, was politics discussed at the dinner table growing up, or was it something that you were the dark horse of the family and it came out of left field? Just talk to me about what what was the draw of politics for Pat? See, I don't. I, I know that there are many who disagree with me, but I don't consider myself a politician. If anything, I consider myself an ambassador for my town and now on the SUMA board for the southeast corner of Saskatchewan. But yes, uh, politics was very much a, a topic of conversation. My grandfather had come from England. Uh, he was a newspaper man, so news and getting people's opinions was vital to him. My mother followed in that footstep working in the newspaper office in my hometown. And uh, at, at one time, oh, this must be 30 plus years ago, we almost had my brother uh, ready to run for a provincial seat in Manitoba. I, I'm not sure how serious he was, but it was something that, that he, he certainly was quite intrigued by. So we've we've danced around the edge of politics probably most of my life. What was the draw municipally, though? Because the one reason why we do this show is to try to figure out why people get involved municipally. It is the closest government to the people. The decisions that you make on a day-to-day -day basis affect the people on a more uh, regular basis than what happens provincially or even federally. So for you, when you went to go back to those uh, that first election that you ran in, what was it about the municipal arena that you said your service, your duty would be best put into the municipal realm rather than the provincial or federal realm, like possibly your brother would have in Manitoba? When, uh, when we moved to Kipling, Kipling chose us and we chose Kipling. <laughs> And it, it, I'm, I'm very serious, and I won't get into the, the intricacies of it, but suffice it to say, we had two, uh, two sons. One was going into grade six, one going into grade four. They were very busy. My husband was very busy. Uh, it, I was looking for something, and this community that had, had been extremely welcoming to us uh, it it just it just seemed like the right fit. I had previous to that even been involved with a an economic development committee, which had very little in the way of teeth, but we were able to affect a few things happening. Um, we I'd been working with my husband joined Lions when we moved here. Um, I have since joined, but uh, we we always felt that any community we were in, it was important that we participate in it and 
do the best we could to enhance the community. And that seemed like the best avenue to do it. Now, you've been in politics for some time now, so I'm going to ask a very odd question, but I, I want I, I asked a lot of your colleagues while I was at the SUMA convention, and I want to get your opinion on this. Politics, especially at the municipal level, it seems like there's a very apathetic tone towards it. People don't seem to be engaged. They don't seem to be wanting to get involved municipally as they would provincially or federally. Going back to that first election when you ran compared to the last election you ran, are, have you seen a more apathetic tone towards municipal government over the last few years of your elected time? I have seen both uh, a declining interest, shall we say, yeah. <laughs> and now, now quite an uptick in interest. Um, currently, as of the election in 2020, my council of me as mayor and six councillors, I have one who is a veteran, and I have five who had their first election in 2020. Uh, at that time, there were two, myself and one other, who ran for mayor, and there were 11 who ran for council seats. Oh, wow. And to me, that, that is, yeah, that, that's a real indication that people are, uh, that are becoming more interested some say it's because, you know, certain people want to change the way some things have happened. Others say they just, they, they have kind of reached that point in their lives where they feel it's time to, to uh, step up and get involved more because the reality is those of us who've been around a while aren't going to be, aren't going to be around forever. No, and it, it, Go ahead. Them Sorry. To be learned. No, that's fine. It it really behooves them to be learning about what, what, uh, how this whole procedure works, and how to effectively make change for the good of the whole community, not for a small segment of it necessarily, but for the entire community. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on in the conversation when we talk about the yeah. town of Kipling as a whole. But I want to stick to you for a second, because I, I try to do as little bit of research as possible. I, I learn about who you are and I read your bio on the on websites, but I like to learn about who you are from you. And I want to know from you, uh, I'm assuming and I apologize if I'm incorrect here, but you, you started your political journey, not as mayor of the town, but as councillor, correct? Or did you go right into the mayor's sure. position? No, I, I started as a counselor. In fact, I have, uh, I've been counselor, mayor, counselor, mayor. I've been kind of back and forth at various times in the, in the years I have. And I've had times when I was not on council, in some cases because of where I was working and the amount of work I was doing, because I've been a teacher for north of 30 years. And, uh, so the reason yeah, I asked I that, the, re the reason I asked that, Pat, yeah. and I apologize to interrupt, is I want to ask this question. And yeah. this is the question that I, I want to get into with you for a little bit. How much weight and responsibility do you put on yourself every time you go into that council chambers, whether it be as councillor, whether it be as mayor? Because the decisions, like I said earlier on, the decisions that you make are going to affect the day-to-day -day lives of the people in your community. So how much of a responsibility do you put on yourself every time you get that agenda package or if you get a, a comment from a resident that you are informed, but you are also engaged with what is going on in your community? Personally, that to me is is vital and it doesn't matter to me whether it is a matter of a council meeting which we had last night or meeting with uh, a group or an individual in the community uh, I do know what my role is and I do know what what things I can and cannot say because things that are in the process of being sort of hammered out oftentimes cannot be discussed 
in full. Uh, but it's a, to me, it's it's vital. What I have tried to I said I was a teacher. I still am a teacher. Uh, maybe not in the classroom now, but I've been trying to teach these younger counselors that for every hour we spend in a meeting, there almost needs to be two hours of prep time. Time to read over the package, to mull it over. And I, I mean that very seriously. I read the package that we had for last night on Friday for the first time. I read it the second time Friday night. Saturday, I read it and started jotting down questions, notes, comments I wanted to make about various things. Because if we don't put that kind of preparation in, for one thing, our meeting lasts insanely long. And I, I'm an old person. I, I can't be sitting there for five hours. That, my body won't take that. Uh, and so my brain shuts off. Uh, and I think that's typical for all of us. I'm not just talking about us older folk. We, we do need to be prepared so that when we go to discuss something, we're not in a vacuum. And you, you can't make a decision in a vacuum. Do you find, uh, exactly. and, and I'm going to, I'm going to pose a follow-up question right now on you on here, because uh, you, you, what you've just said has brought like butterflies to my stomach, because I love when you, when people talk about that, you can't put yourself into a vacuum, whether it be social media, whether it be just talking to your friends about issues, you have to talk to everyone, especially in your position. So I want to know from you, does that make good governance at the end of the day when you don't talk to people in your only you you don't just talk to the people in your circle but you talk to everyone people who agree with you people who disagree with you and you talk to people at all backgrounds all uh situations whether it be uh land use bylaw or a uh, noise law bylaw you talk to everyone who might be affected I certainly try to, and I've, I've made myself very, very open to that. Uh, people, people kind of laugh and say, your husband is your secretary. He, he often, not so much in the last few years, but early on, we kept a notepad right beside the, of course, this is back when we still had a landline, and a notepad and a pen sat there. And if somebody called and I happened to be away teaching, if he got home before me or some such, he would write down the name, the phone number, and the topic. And he all he'd say is, she'll call you when she gets home. And, you know, it, it, I, I did. I did. Uh, I may end up on some occasions saying, I don't have the information on that. I've never been afraid to say, I don't know, but I can find out. Because I'm not going to try to uh, pull the wool over somebody's eyes and say, I, I know everything about everything. I don't. Not, no individual does. That's why we have committees to uh, dig a little deeper into something so that then we can take refined information to the council meeting and be able to uh, be able to talk with a little bit of, of knowledge even if it's not my knowledge, but someone else on council who has looked into it more fully. Here's an example. Our water treatment plant went online just before COVID hit. We, we had a north of $4 million project to change things out, to change out our source and all of the procedures for dealing with it. And during, it, it took probably 10 years from the first time we said, okay, this is something we've got to look at until the water was turned on through the new plant. And uh, during that time, I often had people saying, why is it taking so long? When is this water gonna be better? You know, all these questions. And I said, do you want it done fast or do you want it done right? 
we are we are basically going to school and learning so much before we make <laughs> a, a final decision and i don't i don't begrudge that time of learning and that time of making thoughtful and considered decisions because every penny that we spend is penny that is pennies that have come i know there are no pennies anymore but <laughs> money that has come from from our from our taxpayers or grants that have come from other levels of government that also come from our taxpayers so we we have to be responsible for all of it for trying to make the right decisions and it's it, it can be it can be scary it can be frustrating it can be tiring but in order to do it right, we have to do our homework. Have you found the balance yet? In your job, you are an elected official first and foremost. When you go to the grocery store, you have to be ready to answer questions from your local constituents. When you're at home, people can call you on a regular basis when you had a landline. Or if you give out your cell phone, you have to be prepared to have people call you oh. or even email you. Have you found that balance yep, to be able to say... I'm Pat today and I'm Mayor Jackson when I'm working, or are you always Mayor Jackson as much as you tell people just call me Pat? Uh, I am Mayor Jackson, but people understand if I say, look, I, I've got to get my groceries. I'm sorry. I've got something in the oven. I've got to get home and get it out because I don't have an office at the office, if you will. Uh, I, my office is wherever I end up meeting people, but most are very, very good. If I say, listen, could we meet at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning at the community center? We've got a meeting room there. We can go and sit down and deal with this. Or if it's someone with a, can this be done because, you know, they've got a, I remember one time there was a tree that was literally splitting and half of it was heading towards someone's house my husband and I took a drive around there because he's got more idea of what trees might do and he said yeah that's got to come down it's got to come down yesterday so I don't go to the staff because here's the way the municipalities act says and I follow it we have one employee and that is the CAO yep so I got hold of my CAO and I said, I have at the request of a citizen come and looked at a tree. And in my opinion, it does need to be dealt with now. She said, I'll get to the foreman right away and he can go and get it checked out. They ended up sort of chaining it together. The two halves that were trying to fall apart uh, short term until they could get uh, the proper equipment and so on to to take down. But I try I try to direct people most of the time. Somebody will come and say, "When is this going to be opened? When's the pool opening? When's the when when is this back lane going to be graded?" And I'll say, "That is operational. Phone the office. They will be able to give you um, a timeline on when they." these things are going to be happening. And people are okay with that answer? Because I can imagine as someone who's worked in a municipality before, you ever brush someone off and tell them, oh, that's not my purview, it's operations. So you have to go talk to the CAO or talk to town office. People can sometimes be upset, not saying all of them are, but in my tenure as a communications person for a municipality, I can tell you telling people, to go talk to somebody else. It doesn't usually end well for some politicians. Well, uh, I've always sort of felt, what can they do to me? Not elect me next time? <laughs> That's their choice. I love uh, that. I love that answer. Well, and quite frankly, I've got, what, 17 months or thereabouts until we have our next municipal election. And I'm not planning on running and my community knows that um but what what also has helped get so much of this clear to the community um 
oh, it's close to 10 years ago now, although we did have a several year hiatus, as did many people with things during COVID, we started having a supper once a year. And it cost very little because the town did a bit of subsidizing, but it was our part of our community engagement, which we take extremely seriously. And whoever the mayor has been at the various times has one of the parts of it is explaining, doing the teaching about what my job is, what the job of the council is, what the job of the, of the staff is. Trying to explain that, then trying to explain, you know, then it's what did we do in, we had this two, three weeks ago in 2022, what, what was accomplished? What's in the works for now? And what are we looking forward to? What ac activities or projects are going, are upcoming? And then it's a matter of, now, we want your feedback. I can't know what you're thinking. I lost my ability to read minds a long, long time ago. <laughs> and I, I, I talk to people in that kind of a manner. I, I'm not nearly as formal as I probably should be than, than I'm sure many mayors are. These, these are my friends and neighbors who have entrusted me and the other counselors with doing the business of the town. And so when I tell them, this is what we're thinking about, um, one of the things that we are, it's, it's still just done in pencil because we're a long way from anything, is uh, a new arena. Our arena is, it's getting very, very long in the tooth. Uh, and I said, you guys have got to weigh in on this because it's going to be a very expensive proposition. Uh, contact me. Give me your thoughts. Contact the office. Send off a letter to the office. We'll, we can keep a file of all the comments we get. And as we are making decisions. And I mean, there's going to be a very form, much more formal kind of, of uh, process where we do invite people to weigh in on whether, first of all, whether or not we, we feel we can afford it. Second of all, how much can we afford? And even, even do you want this? So, because even the people in their 70s who may not be using the arena, which is our, my case, uh, we have a right to indicate, yes, I support it because it's good for the whole community, or I'm too much of a tightwad to want to have any kind of tax increase to cover it. That's part of what you have to do to be responsive to a community we're talking about community a lot here so i want to turn to my the big segment of this interview and that's about the town in general now from that last statement that you just made <clears throat> there it sounds like infrastructure funding and funding for projects is a big concern for your community but I want to know from you exactly, and in your opinion, and this is only your opinion, this is not a motion of counsel for anyone who's listening to this right now and is about to send me a nasty email saying uh, you shouldn't have asked that question because it's not a counsel. I understand Mayor Jackson is not the counsel right now. She is Mayor Jackson, and this is her opinion. So in your opinion, Pat, what is the biggest issue facing the town of Kipling right now? I would say the biggest issue we have is the same biggest issue that every other community, not just across the southeast of Saskatchewan, or even not just across Saskatchewan, but across all of Canada is, is facing. And that is infrastructure that is aging. 
And I'm not talking just about things like the arena, which I mentioned, but we all have uh, water and sewer lines. You know, those things that are hidden that nobody sees, nobody is really aware of, that are getting older and older. We have streets. We happen to be very, very fortunate here. Most of our streets are paved. Uh, people who were on council a pile of years ago um, were very forward thinking and did pave streets. Now it's up to us to keep them maintained. Same with sidewalks, same with all the various buildings that, that a community owns, that a municipality owns. Infrastructure is vital. But I'm going to throw a second big issue out there. And I'm not, I'm not telling tales out of school because, again, this is not just Kipling. This is province-wide and probably Canada-wide. And that is our health care. We've got, we've got a hospital here, which is quite new, um, seven years, I think. Something in that neighborhood. I could be out by a year or two. Wonderful memory. But, and we, we've been very blessed. During COVID, we never had a bypass because we did not have staff. We did have bypasses because we did not have um, EMS staff for the, for the uh, ambulances. But I've got a neighboring community that has just from 2019 to now, they've just got their hospital reopened for a few hours a day, wow. Monday to Friday at that. You know, uh, this is something that rural communities in particular are facing, but I'm not saying that, that the cities don't have the same issue, just in a slightly different form. They may have the, the big hospitals that that we out here have to go to for our specialist needs, but they're having as much trouble having getting enough uh, boots on the ground staff. Does that make the 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 nurses, the lab techs, the X-ray people, the you know all of the people who do the day-to-day -day work? It, it's We've got in Canada, and this I've kind of been digging into because we still have a lot of family in Manitoba. We've got some health care systems that, if they're not broken, they're certainly badly bent. And I'm, I'm going to interject here for a second because I want to, because yeah. you're on a topic that I. I have been dealing with on a regular basis healthcare. And I'm not not trying to say that it's not. It's it is an issue because I see it here in Alberta one on one when I go into the hospital. But I'm yep. not I'm not telling you something you don't know here. Healthcare is not a municipal issue. Healthcare is not an nope. issue that you have to deal with around the council table. But I'm going to caveat that by saying you know it is there now. You know that healthcare has become not only a provincial issue, but a municipal issue. Because if your hospital gets closed down, your healthcare clinic gets closed down, you don't have doctors or nurses in your community. Who who are they? Who are your residents going to call? They're not going to call your MLA. And I could be wrong in your community, they might, but they're going to call you. They're going to call the mayor and council and say, why is our healthcare facility closed? And why aren't we doing more to get more doctors? So I want I want you to put on your AB uh, sorry your Suma hat on right now and I want you to tell me <laughs> how does Suma deal with this issue while it no understanding it's not a municipal issue it's a provincial one <laughs> and they should be fixing it not you guys I know and is there an easy answer absolutely not <laughs> they we we discuss we discuss healthcare 
probably at every board meeting because it's it's something that we are all affected by. And on, on our board, we've got people from cities, people from towns, people from villages who rarely have their own health care, but are certainly wanting to make sure that the closest town to them or the closest city to them does have these facilities. And basically we've, no, it's not part of our responsibilities according to, well, the acts that set out responsibilities, but we still are advocating regularly with the, with, the ministers, we have two health ministers in Saskatchewan, one for, I don't know, I guess the bigger yeah. hospitals. Uh, from and what I, from one from for, my time that I was uh, covering uh, provincial politics in Saskatchewan, I remember one was for the healthcare system as a whole, and then one was the. And if, I'm not sure if it's still the same because I, I just know the gentleman who was in that position when I was covering it. One was for rural healthcare, which I always found uh, suspicious because I didn't think that an issue that was rural was not the issue of a large city or just in general a city that would be dealing with healthcare. Well, but. <laughs> one of the ministers has the, I, and please, if I miss something, please, I hope nobody starts ranting and raving. Rural and remote health, uh, addictions and mental health. And I think there's another title in there as well. Like he's got what to me is the bulk of the issues. And yep. as a consequence, I have had I've had several conversations with him, um, you know, trying to trying to make sure this was particularly during COVID when, when getting ambulance service was difficult at best. Um, so I have to ask the question we, because I think this is the this oh. this 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 brings back to this question of how do you fix problems where Let's be honest, infrastructure funding for projects, most of your infrastructure funding comes from provincial government. Uh, yes, it does come on That's the backs it. of uh, the taxpayer as well, but I shouldn't say on the backs of the taxpayer, but taxpayers have to pay their costs to their fair share as well. The federal government has grants that you can apply for. How does how do municipalities the size of Kipling address these issues in a sustainable way when everyone right now, and I can imagine your budget session this year was probably hard due to the fact that a lot of things are going up and there's no money to pay for the things that you hope to get done. Um, you, you walk on eggs. <laughs> you very, very much have to have to walk, have, have to deal with things. What we tend to do is we've got we've got our needs, and they have to be taken care of first, and that that involves you know basically paying the paying the light bill and all the rest of that, providing providing good water to our residents, providing uh, the sewer lines to get the wastewater out, keeping our streets our sidewalks in in appropriate repair so they are not dangerous. Um, paying for the protective services, and we won't even get into that right now because that can be another whole topic of discussion. We're but going to be doing a special episode on the RCMP download here uh, in a few days. So we will make sure that we, we say that Kipling is feeling that <laughs> crunch as well, I'm assuming. <laughs> Well, actually, in Saskatchewan, I do have to give our provincial government kudos for one thing. Uh, when this, when the discussion started, and here's the big crunch for me: municipalities were not at the table, not Suma, not whatever. I'm sorry, I've forgotten the Alberta equivalents. 
Alberta RNA is one of them. Yeah, Alberta municipalities is what we're called. Okay. Um, not the ones from Manitoba, not even the ones from Ontario and Quebec. None were at the table. But the decisions were made, basically, that municipalities would have to pay uh, the back pay and then pay the increases. Well, our, our provincial government, thank the Lord, realized that many of the municipalities would not or could not uh, be tucking their, their money away to cover it. So they did. It didn't cover all, but they have, they have assured that we've got three different things happening in Saskatchewan. We do have some communities with their own police forces, mostly cities. But we've also got eight communities, the smaller cities in general, that have their own contract with the RCMP, well, with the federal government hence the RCMP, uh, to provide services, they will still have to pay the back pay. But all of us that are under a provincial agreement, our back pay is covered, which means I don't have to magically come up with another several hundred thousand dollars to pay it this year. Uh, Mayor Jackson, I want to jump into this question. Because you've laid out two issues that you believe are important to your community, sustainable growth infrastructure, whether that be the aging infrastructure issue and uh, repairing the ongoing aging infrastructure issue and healthcare. Now, if I go to your community tomorrow and I ask 100 people what their big issue is, what their priority is, they're going to give me different issues. They may talk about health care. They may talk about education. But you and I both know they're going to also talk about the micro issues. We need a new pool. We need X. We need that pothole in my front of my house fixed. And you, at the end of the day, have to look with counsel, have to look at all the issues that people come to you with and try to figure out what the wants and needs of your community are, and then decide at the end of the day who gets what they want and who doesn't. Because you know and I know that municipalities don't have a lot of funding for a lot of things. You can't run deficits like the federal or provincial governments. You have to balance your books at the end of the day. So how do you, as mayor, as council, ensure that everyone's issue and everyone's priority is addressed while looking at the big picture of the town of Kipling as a whole? I think uh, 90% of that comes down to communication. (laughs) Um, No, I'm I'm really brutally serious on this. Uh, A year and a half ago, we had a lady who said, there are no trees that run behind. She happens to live the back of her yard faces onto a parking lot basically to the where the pool is and there are trees that run down most of the that run but not past her place and she said can this be addressed and we said we'll certainly look into it we kept her informed that yes we were making arrangements uh and it's going to be taken care of this year. Now, she was happy as can be because we hadn't just ignored her. And I think that is such a big thing. Um, Someone who had some real drainage issues, the foreman and a couple of the counselors who probably understand drainage better than I do. And I went, we took a look we talked to the, the homeowners all around, found out what the root cause of the drainage issue was, and said, we'll take care of it as quickly as we can. Uh, most of it is if you keep people in the loop, that you're not being ignored, uh, we, we're having to find out what's the best way of dealing with this. And whether or not it's something that can be dealt with this week, this year, or maybe not for another couple of years, 
because of financial issues. Uh, most people, I yeah, there are going to be some, always going to be some, who are going to snip and snap and be upset because it wasn't done yesterday. But for the most part, we're finding people will say, okay, that makes sense. You've got this much to get done now. You'll you'll get to that. We keep sort of running lists. Gail does. My my CAO is wonderful. She keeps a running list of of issues and they chip at them as as time and money permit. And we keep people informed. And that to me has been the biggest thing. Uh yeah, we can do it in a town of under eleven hundred people. It it is tougher in bigger places. I I get that. That's probably why not I'm not in a bigger place. <laughs> you know, it I like to be able to this morning I was out when I was digging some weeds out of one of the boxes. Neighbor across the way was hanging clothes up. I waved to her. She's as happy as can be. You know, because we'll have a we'll have a really fine garden gardening chat later in the week. If if there are problems that come up, like I've said to you already, I am not the least bit afraid to say to people, I don't have an answer for that, but I can get one. And I do the same with Suma. I've got seventy four communities, my my own being one of, in the southeast corner. And I have told all of them, if they have questions, they can ask. If I don't know the answer, I've got people at the SUMA office who can dig and find out for me. That's, I'm just sort of a conduit of information in a sense. Um, are I, people, are people the, willing to hear that you don't know? Because I because I just spoke with Keith Comstack and uh, Malcolm Eaton, former <laughs> mayor of Humboldt, and the one thing that uh, they they were talking about, we had this big round table on trust in politicians. Um, politicians yeah. are, and I think they actually spoke about the issue at Suma, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's where I got the idea for the round table. We we talked about how people don't want to be messed around they want the honest truth but sometimes the honest truth is hard to hear right because when you tell yeah. someone i don't know i will find out sometimes it can come off as oh you're blowing me off just like every other politician has blown me off on this issue for you how important is it for you to do that follow-up to say hey i heard you we talked a week ago here's the answer you were looking for and i followed up and i found it for you is that the most important part of that whole scenario that you were just talking about when you are the conduit and that conduit has to be both ways? It can't just be taking the information and passing it on, but also giving it back to the people? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, very, very often people, first of all, want to be heard. They want to know that somebody is listening, that somebody has heard what their issue the dog is barking all night long. Okay, fine. Can you tell me which dog? Which, whose yard is it? Um, well, I don't know. And my answer to that is, neither do I. I don't live at your side of town. I don't know who the, I, you know, you're going to have to get me a little more information. And then we can, we can do some digging. I also had somebody say, the dog from next door is really causing all kinds of problems in my yard. I'm going to have to hose my house down, the bottom of my house down because it's defecating all over it. That person knew exactly whose dog. We went, I said, let Gail know, let her went out. And, you know, we, we can deal with it if we have the information and then we can get back to that person and do, um, the staff I have I call them my girls because they're all younger than I am and they are super at dealing with you know, somebody comes in and they're very upset about something first of all they're very good at diffusing 
which you have to do because they have to get down to the point where they're on the ground before that you can make sense out of them. And then, all right, I'm writing it down. You will hear back from somebody within a week because sometimes it takes time to find out the information. Yeah. And that, that, that's as important as listening in the first place. And I, there have been times I have had to call people back and say, okay, I found out this information. Here's what I know. And it may be, we can't at this point do anything about that issue. But, you know, here's how you can, here's how you can perhaps address it. Uh, in some cases, it may be a matter of, this is an issue that will have to be taken care of by the RCMP. And you will have to do a formal complaint. Um, it's, you know, there, there are things that are outside of our sandbox. No, and, there, there is. Know, I, and people are getting, I, I think the, the fact that we have been here for almost 40 years makes, does make a difference. And plus in a small can, town, everyone knows everyone, right? That's the great thing about small yeah. towns. That's why I love them so much is while everyone knows everyone, you know, like what issues are going on in your community, but you know, Hey, there's a black dog on this street that's barking and someone could be like, Oh, that's Johnny's dog or Sandra's dog or Sarah's dog or Bob's dog. And everyone will know and rally around yeah. and say, okay, let's, let's get the dog home or let's, let's try home. and figure, let's get, let's yeah. figure it out. Who's barking. But I am cautious of time here, and I want to turn to my favorite subject because I know yeah. this is the subject that you were so excited about when I approached you, and that is tourism. <laughs> tourism, tourism, tourism. And I am so excited because I, I told you when we chatted at SUMA, I will be coming through your community if you come on my show. So I'm looking forward to being in Kipling either this year or later next year, right before SUMA 2024. But, Pat, in your opinion... What yeah. are some of the hidden gems that people should visit or do while in the town of Kipling? Well, I mean, we've got the the usual things. We've certainly got ball diamonds. If you come the July long weekend, there is a ball tournament. It's a, a slow pitch memorial tournament. This this year will be the eleventh for it. We've got our pool. We've got we've got a historic walking tour for now if i were talking to somebody from quebec or from halifax they would laugh like mad at us calling things historic here because <laughs> these houses may be 100 years old and of course they've got many places that are 300 plus but for our community they are and we've got a, you know, just a pamphlet made out that you can follow along. And it tells the story of, of certain dwellings in, in the place. Uh, just to the south of town, we've got uh, an old back of our church. It was built in the early 1900s. And it's built on the same design as one from, uh, oh, Lord love us, I'm going to be shot for this. I cannot remember the name of the community in Hungary. We have a, a fairly decent sized Hungarian community in here, some of whom came in 1897 and then some came in 1956. Oh, wow. And uh, yes. And then we've also got, uh, or we often end up having. Filipino activities because we've got a community of oh 120 or so Filipinos. Like our school probably has 40 or 50 Filipino students in. They have come here as as uh, agricultural workers and made it their home. Well, that's awesome. Um, 
But there's something that you haven't mentioned yet, and I want to get it on the record because <laughs> when doing research for the town of Kipling, there's only one thing that kept on coming up every time I typed in Kipling, Saskatchewan, and that is the story of the big red uh, paper clip. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. can you tell have, my my listeners have- and my viewers uh, what the big t- uh, the big red cl- uh, paper clip is all about? Uh, uh, quite a number of years ago, a gentleman who lived at the time in Montreal was uh, bemoaning the fact that, of course, in the city of Montreal or in many cities, uh, home ownership is pretty much out of reach for a lot of people. And he happened to be sitting at his computer and Craigslist was a big thing at that time. I didn't know anything about Craigslist. I was busy teaching. He picked up a paper clip and said, I wonder what I could get for this. And he started a, a thread on Craigslist to see what he could get for a red paper clip. Uh, he got a, a pen that was shaped like a fish. And then he took the pen that was shaped like a fish and he tried to see what he could trade for that. Twelve trades later, he was in possession of a, well, I guess 10 trades later, he was in possession of a KISS snow globe. And he happened to have read that that Corbin Burnson was very interested in snow globes. I guess he has a massive collection of them. So he contacted, through, probably through one of the studios and so on, are you interested in this KISS snow snow globe and if so what would you trade for it and he they made the trade no problem and so now he's in possession of a part in a movie to be done in LA he puts this out and it happened at the time we had an economic development officer who definitely uh, was could think outside the box and this fellow had seen this. So I'm in a classroom 15 miles away from here one, one Monday, and it happened to be council meeting Monday. He phoned me. The first thing I had to do was say to him, Bert, you have to slow down and breathe. I can't understand a word you're saying. So he did enough that I got the gist of this. He said, we need to get involved. We need, I said, put something together, bring it to council tonight, which he did. It was hard to understand him even then because he was most of the time about a foot and a half off the floor. And uh, I have used the term synchronicity. Things must align before something can happen. It happened that we have, had at the time a council that was willing to be just a wee bit, well, some say wacky, some say out of the box, just were, were afra- weren't afraid to look at a very different possibility. The town ended up committing a very small amount of money. We purchased a building on Main Street. It was a house, it was a residence. Uh, that it had a checkered past, but we thought anything in a residential area wouldn't be a good idea because we could see that there was going to be some publicity over this. So we purchased that, did some basic maintenance to the to the thing, gave it a really good coat of paint because let's just say it it was many, a coat of many colors prior, and. Uh, did the trade and we is, ended up doing as a as a subsequent to that in september of that year we had the world's largest housewarming party and uh they did the did the auditions for the movie that corbin had written he came up to kipling and did the auditions and uh, liked the community so well and liked 
some of the people, even the ones who did not win the 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 part, that he wrote he wrote another movie that was produced almost entirely by community members who bought shares in Kipling Film Productions, and the movie Rust was was uh, filmed with the exception of a few cuts that were done at some larger buildings in Regina. The rest was done in, in Kipling. And if any of your listeners want more information on it, they go to a website called oneredpaperclip.com. Which the link will be in the show notes for anyone who wants to go to it. Thank you. And the movie was called Rust. And the idea with the name of it was, you know, back in the 30s, Rust was one of the biggest problems that affected farmers, largely in Saskatchewan. Uh, It was a problem with wheat, but it was also talking about the rust of the soul kind of thing. Wow. And so... so Lots of local people in, were involved in it, both as actors and uh, these people who came up from from L.A. couldn't believe it because they were used to a production site where the extras, you the the actors, the name actors, had nothing to do with all the other people. Well, sorry. That didn't happen. The production office was in the Legion Hall and everybody was there. It didn't matter whether you were a volunteer uh, who had had brought in some props. They all intermingled. The people who came up were just floored by it. So are, is the big yeah. giant, I, because I know that you, you created the world's largest paperclip, if I'm not mistaken, as to the Guinness Book of World Record, correct. and the That's house, right. still a tourist draw to this day. This is almost nine, 16 years ago we're talking about. Is it still a tourist draw today? Yes. Uh, we knew that Kyle was not going to come and be a resident of Kipling. You know, he... He was a city boy, and he, you know, his his interests diverged greatly from anything out here. But we had so much press. We had we had film crews from Germany, from Japan, from oh, countries that I can't even remember. Uh, people were up on the roof of of uh, buildings across from the house filming when the the trade actually was made. Um, it, we have, we have a giant red paper clip uh, right beside our community center. It's uh, the, the plaque from, from Guinness is inside our community, our town office. As people stop, my my office staff from their their office windows can see the paper clips. And they say that a week doesn't go by without somebody stopping to take pictures. And we still, on the 10th anniversary, there were all kinds of interviews and that kind of thing. It it it's something that when people think of the town of Kipling, most most won't have a clue where it is. If people say, where are you from? And I say, I'm from Kipling, Saskatchewan. And they say, oh, where's that? What's, what's, what goes on there? And I say, look up oneredpaperclip.com. And they'll say, red paperclip? We've heard of that. So it may be old news, but it still exists. So I want to end on, and I want to end on this question for you, Mayor, because this is the most important question at the end of the day, and this one you can take as long as you want or as short as amount of time as you want to answer. But I want to encapsulate basically the last forty-five minutes of conversation with this question: What makes the town of Kipling such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? People. 
one word. The people who are here really make the community. The ones that you love dearly, the ones that you just like, the ones that you know, the ones that you don't know, even the ones that now and again are irritants, it is the people. Uh, I said Kipling chose us. When we came here in March of 1984, it didn't make sense for us to be here. It made far more sense for us to be someplace in Manitoba. Our family was from there. Um, our, my, at that point, my mother was still alive. My brother was in Manitoba. All of Larry's brothers and sisters were there. It was the people that, that just made it that this was the place that we were to be. Mayor Jackson, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for taking time out of your busy schedule to do this today. It's always an honor to speak to people who are so passionate about giving back to their community, but also so passionate about their community as a whole. And I, I say this seldomly, but I say it with uh, all respect to whenever, whenever to the people, whoever I say it to, but your community is better served with that, uh, with you at the council table. And in our interview, you announced that you were not going to be seeking re-election and your community knows that. And it's going to be a loss for the town of Kipling. So I appreciate you taking your time and doing this with me today. Thank you very much for your time. Have yourself a great day. So before you leave, I, I want to just uh, say uh, thank you so much for listening to the cross-board interviews. We'll be back. 